So let's dive in. Are you ready? We'll talk about you sure. for about an hour here. Um, if you really want. <laughs> no, I do. And I have so many things I want to talk to you about. And I have some things I'll show it to I'll show to you. I bet this hour will go really fast, I promise. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Let's start from the beginning. How did you get involved in competitive swimming? Uh, well, my father was a swimmer and he swam for Purdue. Um, he learned how to uh, swim in the New Jersey area. And um, there was a great coach over there who was a longtime coach at Princeton that he learned from. And uh, so he, he was, he was the reason why I got started and I, I was living outside of uh, of Chicago, in kind of the northern area, and so I went to New Trier, and that's where I learned. That's where I really began swimming for a couple of years. When I was growing up, I moved around every two years because of my father's career. So it, it actually worked out pretty. It was pretty neat because it, it, in that period of time, um, I actually got got to work with some great, outstanding coaches. Um, so then I, you know, from there I went over to Pittsburgh and um, I swam for this sort of unusual team called the YM and WHA, you know, Young Men and Women's Hebrew Association. And they had this amazing coach there. His name is Al Rose. And if you look up Al Rose, you can see that he's, he's actually coached up some Olympians. But, you know, that I was very young then. And so, you know, Al, Al would be one of these, you know, really incredible technical coaches. So uh, at least once a week, he would just one-on-one -on -one with you, sit on the side of the pool, he'd smoke this pipe with this cherry tobacco that would come out and you could smell it while you swam. <laughs> and, um, but what he would do is he, he'd say, okay, swim down, you know, do a turn and come back. And then he would talk to you about your stroke. And, you know, everybody used to comment on what a, wonderful looking stroke I used to have and I would credit Al Rose for that. He he spent a lot of time, you know, talking about body position, where your arms need to be, where your elbows need to be. And and then you you work on your foot turn and everything else, uh, or your turns and everything else. Um and so that 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 was that's what kind of set me up in terms of my stroke. Would you say that it was in that Pittsburgh time and uh that maybe you started to realize that or was it earlier where you started to realize that you could be good do you remember breakthrough no, I hate, moments i hated swimming i hated swimming you know i hated swimming i really did my all my friends were playing baseball uh, and i loved the team sports so i had to constantly beg my kid my, my parents to let me play some team sports like baseball and i love baseball but I, I i hated swimming uh but i kept swimming it was great exercise you know i and i was, I was I wasn't great at it. You know, I'd go to those huge age group meets like in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. That was a huge one. And, uh, you know, I'd get eight, you know, if I was lucky, and, you know, a bunch of ribbons. And you would sit there and you eat that, that, that sugar, you know, you get your jello packs and you just eat your sugar all day as you sort of sat around playing cards with friends and you, you know, it, it was, that was just god awful, but but I did it, and it, you know it 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 just slowly built the base, and uh, um, so that that was <laughs> that was just like that. That was that was my age group swimming. When do you make your way to Ann Arbor? It was seventy one. Okay. Yeah, I was in. I was. Uh, let's see. I was eleven. Uh, I was in. Se I was seventh there? grade. I was seventh grade. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and then the, we had the Ann Arbor Swimming Club, and you know, in the summer times, Denny Hill would would coach. Who's the you know amazing coach from Pioneer? Yeah, I was just thinking about the timing because I think he leaves Ferndale when they build Fuller. When they get the fifty meter pool, he leaves Ferndale and comes over to Ann Arbor to start that program or be a part of that program. And I think that was in the late sixties, maybe like two years. Uh, I want to say maybe his last year at Ferndale was like 68. So I think he had just gotten to Ann Arbor maybe a couple of years before, before you do. Yeah. 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 There, there is a, a, 
a whole host of really great coaches that kind of work through the Ann Arbor swimming program. Um, Johanna Hill, she, Johanna High, she was the head coach, and I didn't, and I didn't first start out swimming with her. Uh, there are guys like um, uh, Orcott, who is in a, you know, somebody connected with the Pioneer program for years and years. Tony Kashnick, he was another fellow. There were some younger people who came in and out. Um, so I'd spent a lot of time with them before I eventually kind of worked my way up to working out with Johanna. Uh, so w what is the breakthrough? When do you start to realize, you know, you've still described that, no, I still hated it, you know, through those years in Pittsburgh, you know, when, when is the breakthrough where you kind of start to realize that you're better than the guy that takes eighth in Cuyahoga Falls? I was looking forward to swimming in high school. Uh, unfortunately, though, in Ann Arbor, we had sort of an odd system where I was in a junior high school, which meant I had to spend, you know, my ninth grade year, you know, at this middle school level. Uh, so I, I didn't get to swim as a freshman. Uh, but, it, you know, that ninth grade year, I was working out with Johanna at that point, and uh, I was only working out once a day. Uh, so, but, you know, I was working out very, very hard, and, you know, and I, I started to see some improvement at that point. Uh, I was really happy to swim a 510, as I recall, in the 500 yard freestyle. You know, not that great a time, right? But that was that was kind of I felt at the time it was a kind of a breakthrough. The following year, though, I got to swim for Huron, and you know, John Feeney, who's like my second dad, um, introduced me to two a day swimming and, and also tapering and shavering. Uh, you know, I hadn't really done that in the past, so it was that sophomore year, frankly, that I had that huge, huge breakthrough for me. And, you know, and I, I attribute that to John, his training, his workouts, the two-a-days, you know, maybe growing up a little bit, getting a little bigger, more mature. I think Wait. I see you in 145, 446 that sophomore year, and that 145, the 200 freestyle, you slipped into uh, the A final, which I can tell from the seed times, that was a big swim for you to – to dip down to 145 and get into that A final, and then uh, a top three finish in the in the 500, where you really showed out really well. So, no doubt, yeah. the, the number. Wow, that's I'm out. impressed. <laughs> You're impressed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that you even know that. I. Oh, yeah. John, we're just getting started. Then you're gonna love the next <laughs> hour or or hate it. I don't know, but the details I'm ready. I got for you here. Let's keep going. Yeah, so, it was a, it was a it was a conference meet. Yeah. And. I, I had no idea, you know, where I was. I knew I was swimming well, um, but I had no, I had no inkling, you know, what the taper would allow me to do. And so it was this conference that I went to. It was at Pioneer High School. You know, I, and frankly, I just surprised myself. Um, I, I, I just, I swam so easily, you know, and so, and so, so fast. You know, I just. I surprised myself. We've talked about some coaches. I want to talk about a couple of swimmers that I'm curious to hear you uh, speak to a little bit. So your sophomore year, uh, I would imagine that the leader of that team was probably Paul Griffith. Uh, and yep. on his way to a couple of state titles, uh, Denny Hill sent me a text once that, that Paul did a no breather on the last 25 of the 100 butterfly final in 76 to beat Marty Zuba. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but Denny says that, it, that he can't put his head down and brought it home. Now Caleb Dressel does that and people make a really big deal about it. But I, I heard a story once that Paul Griffith did it all the way back in 1976. Uh, tell me about yeah, what kind of influence he was on you as a young swimmer at a point where as you're describing, you're kind of breaking through as well. Sure, well, and then, and then of course, Paul has, has had his younger brother who's my age, Andy Griffith. And so, you know, I, I'd known the Griffiths all my life through Ann Arbor Swim Club. And at some point, I think I carpooled with Andy, you know, so you, you would have that, you know, carpool where you'd go to practices. So Paul was, you know, one of these guys that just was really tough, you know, and you could just tell he was tough. He was always tough. 
and and uh, you know he's always rebellious too. Um, and uh, uh, so you know you you he just had that leadership quality, and and I think he was our captain that year, uh, as I recall. So um, yeah, um, but we had a lot of great seniors at that time. Who you know when you're when you're young like that, sophomore or freshman, and these guys who are seniors are huge compared to you, right? And uh, it's it's you know they're they're mountains. So you really look up to them, and you and you see how much stronger they are than you. And and uh, uh, of course, then you know you know, they're just at a different sort of social level too. You know, as seniors, and so it's it's a it's a very different experience than than what you experience the rest of your life, right? Of course. Another guy I want to ask you about, um, and he would have been in your class, is Mark Stroll. He yeah. was a terrific, obviously, backstroker and IM champion who went on and right. swam in Florida. Tell me about Mark Stroll and what kind of swimmer he was. Oh, he was, he was amazing. Did right. you get to train with him closely in the oh, Antarctic yeah. Club programs? You guys right. being in the same year, I would imagine, and a couple of superstars, yep. you two had to be neck and neck. Yeah, that, you know, and that was the beautiful thing about Denny Hill. Um, he would bring us all together during the summer. And we'd all swim together. We got to be great friends. We went on trips together, had some wonderful trips together. Uh, you know, I remember going to Junior Nationals out in Santa Clara, California, with the group, going down to Alabama, Huntsville, um, you know, with the group. Mar Mark had just um, amazing natural talent. And, you know, he could swim every stroke, which was pretty unusual. Not a lot of swimmers can do that. Uh, and he could, he could swim a great freestyle. He could swim a great backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly. That's why he was such a good I am swimmer. Um, if you were to ask me what was his best stroke, uh, I frankly, I couldn't even tell you. He, he was so good across all of them. Um, you know, so he, he clearly was very good at butterfly. Um, and uh, as well as, but the I am, he was just such a specialist with the I am. And he was such a natural swimmer. Yeah. So. You you always envied those kind of swimmers, you know. There was a guy at that time, his name was Jesse Basayo from Mission yeah. Viejo, and you, you would watch Jesse swim that 400 IM. And same thing, you know. Mark Mark was a swimmer like Jesse. He was just you know very capable across all strokes. The real question was Mark's mustache anywhere near as cool as Jesse's was, because I think Jesse had a mustache in every picture I ever saw of him Jesse, after he was Jesse about 16 years old, right? Jesse had him beat. Sorry. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> um, the last individual that I wanted to talk to you about preceded you, and I was curious uh, if he had any impact on you having passed through three years earlier, but without question, as a distance swimmer in that area, the man was Dan Stevenson. And at the time that you were coming through high school, Dan was rising into the top five to ten 200 freestylers in the world in 1978. He peaked uh, dropping down, I think he went 151 in 1970, uh, yeah, like right in there, 1978. But like just a really great swimmer with a huge impact and reach. Did you get a chance to brush shoulders with Dan and be impacted by him much at all? Not in high school. Uh, he had graduated, you know, as I said, I was a sophomore. So, but, you know, Dan was one of these enigmas. I got to be good friends with Dan, you know, af after, um, and then and then he and I tease each other because he was an Ukula swimmer, and I was a, you know, I became a Texas swimmer, so there's another story there about our infamous loss by a few points to Ukula, um in the NCAA's. But anyways, uh, yeah, he was an enigma, and he was this amazing swimmer who was also incredibly smart, incredibly smart. And, you know, of course, went to UCLA, got his engineering degree, he goes to Michigan, gets his, you know, law degree. And, and, uh, um, but, you know, you know, the, the only problem with Dan, I would say, was, you know, his sense of humor. You know, he needs to work on his sense of humor. I mean, the guy, the guy throws out some of the worst jokes I've ever seen in my life. You know, we got to get him a book so he can, like, learn better jokes. That's what I got to tell him. Tell you about Dan, but it, it, 
but yeah, he was he was the guy, you know. Um, his ability to swim that 200, uh, especially, you know, was always very, very, uh, you know, just something you always like, like. Wow. I would imagine that coming through three years after him, every pool you went to, Stevenson's name was on the wall. I mean, when you refer yep. to him as an enigma, yep. I would he was the target. I would imagine. I mean, he had the state records. Yeah. That we'll get to that in a second, but. Yeah, yeah. Then, then he becomes captain of the UCLA swimming team too, which which is huge, right? You know, this says a lot about who he is too. Absolutely. Well, we didn't come here to talk about Dan Stevenson. We came here to talk about you. So in 77, uh, you get that first state championship. And that's why I asked about Dan last, because in 1977, you have the oh, honor. 78. Let's see. No, that's right. Okay, 78, 70. I bet that's, yeah. You, 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 that's all right. I'm, I'm with you. In 77, okay. your junior year, you had the honor of taking Dan's state record in the 500 freestyle. You took it by just a by just a notch of a few tenths, but you took it down two years after he set it at 438. You went 438 low. You won your first state championship in the 500 free. And for a guy that described to me that maybe just like 12 plus months earlier, it sounds like you didn't really think you were all that great at this. And in about a year, you've broken through to now having a Michigan high school state record, you're a high school state champion, and I'm sure recruiting is heating up. Your life changed a lot in that year. Uh, it, did it not? It did. Yeah, it did. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Tell me about you know, that. And, and I, got a lot of, I got a lot more confidence, you know, in my ability to swim well. I started looking forward to you know, maybe get, getting out into uh, a national, you know, arena. I started thinking more about, you know, okay, what would it take to make nationals? Maybe, you know, I think I qualified for, na might have qualified for nationals, you know, so at some point that year. But some of the coaches said, you know, I, I think you ought to go to junior nationals. Let's just go to junior nationals so you can, because you probably won't make finals at nationals, so you won't get that experience. You'd be better off getting the, prelim final experience at junior nationals and they were right so but so i started thinking more about that kind of you know level of swimming which was a lot of fun when do you make your commitment to michigan does that come before or after your senior year in high school well they're not allowed to talk to you i don't think until sometime at the start of your senior year they couldn't. They couldn't speak to you when you were a junior. Um, uh, you know, at, at that time, Tennessee was a pretty hot swimming team with Ray Buzzard, who was their coach, and uh, uh, you know, Cohen, the great sprinter, uh, Andy Cohen, a few others. Uh, you know, but you know, really, the the center of the universe was Mission Viejo for me at that time. Brian Goodell, he was the guy I, you know, admired the most. Uh, Jesse Fasaya, but those two guys. I mean, was, and, and just the reports you would get back from Mission Viejo was, you know, they would they would swim 22, 21, 20, 23,000 meters a day. <laughs> You're just kind of going, oh my goodness. So actually in 77, I went out and swam for about two months at Mission Viejo with Mark Schubert. And tried that, and just Shirley Babishoff, who was a great Olympian, female swimmer, just kicked my butt <laughs> up and down the pool. It was humiliating, but she, you know, but it, you know, it was crazy. You know, I remember those twenty, twenty thousand plus meter swims a day. I just, you know, we, you got about two thirds of the way through that second workout, and it was just, oh my god, I couldn't. I just could barely finish. <laughs> it was Where, where'd you live? Where'd you train when you went out there? I mean, that's a big deal, right? You're 17 at this time, probably, and you pack your bags for two months and go to California to to train with the best swimmers and coaches in America. That was yeah, a big deal. yeah. So I got I got out to LA, hopped on a bus, went down to the pool um, in Mission Viejo, um, met Mark. Um, they 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 would line up families in the area so i met my family um you know I, I, as i recall they had nothing to do with swimming even 
you know, they just had a couple of young kids. So um, I, I kind of slept in the side side room and, um, uh, you know, it was, it was hard. I was, I was so beat up. There was a few morning workouts, I have to admit. I just said, I can't get up. <laughs> uh, so in 78, just as a follow-up question there, did you, had you committed before the state meet and before like nationals and all that stuff in the spring of your senior year, or did all that happen after? Well, I, I was interested in Michigan for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, you know, my father and Gus Steger were really good friends. Uh, the, Gus is a lot older than my father, but he, and he had served in the war, so he delayed his entry into college as a result. But, you know, dad was at Purdue, Gus was at Michigan, so, you know, um, and of course, you know, Michigan was just, it was pretty cool. They, I love that old Matt Man pool where they had that stadium seating. If you remember that, that was, that was a pretty neat environment. You know, you, it was only a 25 yard pool, but because you had that stadium seating, you, you, you could really get a lot of crowd interaction with a swimmer, which is unusual. I've heard it described as dim and shallow and maybe not the fastest pool. But no, 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 no. A lot Matt of great memories out of that. Matt Man was one of those unique, unique swimming pools that was, you know, way ahead of its time. They had the first electronic timing system uh, that some swim swimmers built who were engineers, and they actually built it. And you, and I, I don't know if they saved it, but it was, it was an analog system. In, in other words, there was nothing digital about it, right? So there was these, you know, clocks that would turn, and there would be six six dials and they would turn and then you still hit that pad and they would stop and it was an electronic it was the very first electronic swimming timing system and and it was all it was all deep the that particular pool was all deep uh you, you could you could argue it was a little dim <laughs> but that crowd could get could get pretty pretty crazy and in 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 gus stager's last year you know, we invited up the Indiana Doc Councilman group and, you know, yeah, we rested a little bit, but, you know, we, we won that dual meet Beat basically him. for yeah. Doc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, you'd won the 500 the previous year. You win the 200 to start the state meet in 78, 141 in prelims, 142 low, but uh, in finals, but that was the first time you'd been 141. Um, I think in prelims, that was a cool accomplishment uh, for you. And of course, you win the, the state meet. And your, your senior year in the 500 freestyle, this is a, this is a race that I've been really interested to, to talk to you um, about because I spoke with Scott <laughs> Tyler about this race a couple of weeks ago. And so he gave okay. me great detail um, about this. Are you interested in hearing what he had to say about the race? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm sure he. That, that was a great race. Believe me, that was. That, uh, Chris, I came out on the on the losing side of that race, but. Can I tell you? That was one. That short was one excerpt here. Uh, sure. Go ahead. The key was, I really didn't have any expectations. I mean, I was super nervous, obviously, going in and and knowing this guy is going to, you know, most likely just grind you up. But I just figured I'll just. I'll hang around and, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm in the game toward the end, I know I've got, I'm a decent closer and lo and behold, I mean, the, the video of that race is I would draw up to about his shoulder on, a, on every turn and come out at his waist and just, it just kept going and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, kind of still in the game here at the 200 and at the 250 and at the three it's like wow it's just he just he never really put me away you turned within one tenth of a second at the 200 exactly even at the 300 exactly even at the 400 and we're separated by eight one hundredths at the 500 the two of you literally swam 500 yards together within a tenth of a second of each other. It's an incredible race. Scott describes it as the pinnacle of his swimming career. And this is a guy that went on to 
some cool things. He went down to 428, I think, 429. He won a MAC championship and broke a MAC record. It wasn't the fastest time he ever went, but it was a powerful moment for him. And I think a big part of it was because he beat you, and you were a special swimmer at that time. So I'm interested in everything you want to tell me about that race. <laughs> it hurt. That race hurt. That race hurt. Um, but you know, that's the beauty of sw swimming. You know, if you're going to be a swimmer, uh, you're going to eventually lose, and um, you're going to have your you're going to have your moments, and you're going to have these moments. And uh, um, you're right. I mean, we both dropped our times considerably. So uh, he, um, I remember, you know, be feeling very good throughout that entire race. And then um, about midway through it or towards the end, you know, noticing that, that Scott was um, hanging in there with me. Um, now my recollection was he, he negative split the 500. I mean, I may be wrong about that, but um, you know, um, I, what, what can I say? I mean, we both swam really good races. His heart was a lot bigger than mine that day. And, and so he won. Um, now these are the splits yeah. that day. The two of you were both out in, he was out in 147.9, you were on 148.0. You swam a slightly different race. You had gone out a little harder the day before in 147 and went slower, obviously, than you went in the final. So I think you, you might have learned a little bit from the prelim and, and controlled yourself just a shade, a shade more. But you guys are dead together, 244.5 at the 300. 340.8 at the 400 and come home um, and you're separated here. And I want to, mm. anybody that might be That's watching us to see 434. Yeah, I don't remember eight. it that way. That's interesting because I, I sort of remember being ahead of Scott the whole way, but, but so uh, numbers don't lie. So there you go. We were dead heat all the way through. Yeah. And um, what I think it was really interesting as I learned about this race before I spoke with the two of you was, of course, these were the years where the official results went to the thousand. And I asked Scott, what was it like in the arena that, in the pool that day? And you guys were at Michigan State. And I said, what was it like in the pool that day? What, when you touched the wall, what did you look to? And he said, there were no scoreboards in the arena, in the pool at McCaffrey. So there was nowhere to find out where you went. So he looked to the scorer's desk and he said his coach uh, had gone to the scorer's desk and gave him a thumbs up or a one. And that's how he knew that he had won the race. And he said he went crazy in the pool, at which I'm sure you remember in, to, <laughs> in some degree uh, it, when you found out that you didn't win that race. But, like, that's how it was at the 1978 Class A state meet was there was no scoreboard to look to immediately to find out who'd won maybe the greatest 500 freestyle in Class A or Michigan swimming history. You guys had to wait a second to find out. Do you remember any of that that detail after the race and, and kind of how it played out? I remember the long bus ride home. It was a it was that was a that was a long bus ride. <laughs> you know, but look, I, I got to win the two hundred, and I was very pleased about that. I was I was happy about my time. Um, you know, I I refocused my efforts. And went to regionals and and bettered my time even farther. Um, I was very disappointed that I lost a senior to this to this junior who you know kind of came out of nowhere, frankly, and just like I did a, a year before. But you know, that it, you're right. It was a it was a hell of a race. I, I remember I remember the crowd noise during that race. It was off the charts and. For, for good reason, obviously, now that I look at those splits. Yeah. Scott said it was vibrating. He said when he came off the 400, so the whole place was vibrating. He just see. Yeah, I was, I was training. I was really trying to train to break 430 that year. I didn't break 430 until my freshman year in college. You got really, really which, close, though. You got really, really which close. Which was kind of a disappointment. You. Well, you know, and of course, like, as I said, I was always I was always a huge admirer of Brian Goodell, right? And Brian Goodell had the national high school record. And it was like 421. So I felt like 421 for me was a bridge too far. 
but you know, I I I, I knew that you got to get in the twenties. You got you got to get in the twenties soon. And um, I didn't make it that year, which was a bit of a disappointment. But um, uh, you know, th- that was the way I kind of viewed my my senior year. My, my time was still good though. You know, yeah, it, well, it, well, I, I was at, I was at a point where I was you know conversing with pretty much every college coach out there so well they, i mean the exclamation point to this story is that you lose an extremely as you described disappointing race and a month later at the 1978 junior nationals you win the 500 in 43127 which is three and a half seconds faster than scott and, and yourself swam uh, at the state championships in East Lansing, like I said, like four weeks earlier. So you did make your statement, and I, I did want to make you know say that that you know for anybody that only looks at the state meet results, you went three and a half seconds faster to win a junior national championship later um, that spring. That was that was definitely not intentional. <laughs> oh, and that's again, those are things that you only learn in these conversations because I would have looked at those times and thought, oh. He was holding back a little bit. He must have been looking to April, and so I I'm glad nope. he had the opportunity. No, nope. no. Nope. So, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna kind of advance the chronology here. You you choose. This is Michigan. impressive that you know this. I, I I'm I'm stunned that you know this. Uh, I'm having to remember things I haven't remembered in quite some time. I always thought Scott kind of chased me down. But I, I, I did not realize we were so we were so even throughout that entire race. Well, he has promised me uh, a video of that race, which he says he owns. So I will confirm the video to the splits. But when you're yeah, looking no, at splits I, from I think 1978, I still have that video too. yeah, we, we had the, the Kaisers. You know, the Kaisers were over at Birmingham. Yeah, was it Andover or Groves? It was one of the two Birmingham schools, and the Kaisers' father was the. Uh, uh, you know, head of the television station in Detroit. So we always, we always got our uh, swimming swimming meets uh, uh, yeah. aired. You know, in, in, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, Jim Kaiser, of course, who went on to swim at Florida, swam at Birmingham Groves. Your memory was right. Guy, he went down to 431, I think, in the 500 during his time down in Gainesville. Great swimmer that you're referencing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've got a, a, some of your times here, and just to kind of advance our discussion here to kind of that second chapter of your swimming career, during the summer before your uh, senior year, uh, you, you, I'm sorry, before your freshman year of college, you go to also to the Long Course Junior Nationals, and after the, having won the 500 in the spring, you win the, the uh, 400 meters uh, long course as well. Junior in, Nationals. This is the Junior, junior Nationals. Junior yeah. Nationals, exactly, right. in, in right. 4032, and that was a top 10 time in the country among 15 to 18-year-olds, and that it got you into the national top 25. You were 23rd in the country for all ages in 1978 and the 400 coming off of that um, senior year, and that sets up your, your freshman year that you referred to, um, where you finally dip under uh, fi- uh, 430 for the first time, but you go way under, right? You go 425-0 at the 1979 NCAAs and prelims, so you storm it. You go way under, um, down to 425, and that's really, I mean, like, you've established yourself, and despite that loss your senior year, this has kind of been a downhill train, or an up, however the, the train is going in whatever direction, where you're building uh, from a state champion swimmer to a junior national swimmer to now you're peaking into the top 15 at NCAAs on a more senior level. This is a, a really big year for you, you where you kind of burst down to 425. Tell me about that, you know, that kind of first year at Michigan, that breakthrough as you kind of, you know, and everything that happened here that we talked about. Well, those are going to be, that was going to be a special Olympics. I mean, that, Moscow Olympics in 1980 was was so so huge. I mean, to go to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Moscow, swim have the possibility of swimming for your country in Moscow was was just a everybody's dream, everybody's dream. And and you know, obviously, you had to swim extremely well to get there. Uh, but everybody, you know, even 
people like me, you know, thought about that constantly. You know, we were just so, so focused on Moscow. It was just huge. Um, so, you know, you, you, you had to swim well to get there and you had to be kind of lucky to get there. So, um, you know, that, that was where my head was that year. Um, what do I got to do to get down there to get there? And I knew I was going to have to get sub 420 or, or, you know, low 350s on the 400 meters to be able to have any chance against guys like Brian Goodell. And, and there were some others that are starting to come out of the woodworks from the West Coast, too. But into the um, spring of 80, you're trending in the right direction. You go 359 at long course, Nats are in the spring heading into Olympic trials. You had been 403 to win a, the Junior National Championship the year before, so four seconds faster as you head into point that there, I, got, I got down to about 357. Yeah, so I was heading in the right direction. Um, Ultimately. What surprised me, what surprised me right about that time is I, I got down into the low 150s on my 200 meters. Um, and I'm not sure what year it was, but one of those years I got, I was world ranked in the 200 meter. And um, um, it was actually off of a front end split of an 800 freestyle relay. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so I started thinking, huh, maybe I got a shot at the 800 freestyle relay. So you, you, you really, you know, you, you started getting pretty excited, you know, as a result of that, because that Moscow Olympics was just huge. I had Jim 153.7 in the 200 meters and 80 at the spring Nats. That might have been the 200 that you were referencing. I don't know if the, that would, would have been before that, but I, I guess where, I, where I'm trying to set up here is you're swimming well, you're trending up, and then the spring of 80 and all of the questions arise about whether there will be a team that's going, when will the decision be made? And I'm actually in the midst of a kind of a study through the 80s right now. And I sat down and read some of the quotes from the swimmers. And it was a very difficult time there for the swimmers not knowing in the spring of 80 what they were training for and what the decision was going to be. I just see that you went 402 at trials, having been 359 in the spring. And I'm curious how you were personally impacted by all the indecision and all the distraction that was going on for Olympic athletes in that spring and summer. There was a lot going on with me at the time. Um, you know, we, Gus Steger was our, my, the head coach who recruited me to Michigan, you know, and I, and I, and I traveled and I talked to um, Don down in Alabama. I really like Don, um, who was the head coach of the Alabama Swimming. Talking about Don Gambrell. Yeah, yeah. I really liked him as a human being. And then and then I, I, I met Eddie Reese at, at Texas. And, I, you know, Eddie was the coach over at Auburn. He was moving to Texas and he was starting to pull his team together. And, and Scott Spann was going to come over from, you know, Auburn and a few others. And they'd have to sit out. Um, so, you know, I, I, go, I get recruited. I go down there and I see this amazing swim center that they just built, which – just blew you away. It, it's still one of the, if not the fastest pool, it's got to be one of the fastest pools in the world still to this day. You know, all, all the features that they built into that, and he showing me that and talking to me. So suddenly my, my world kind of got rocked and I started thinking, you know, I don't know much about Eddie Reese. He seems like a ma an amazing guy. What a great human being he is. And and yeah, this pool's amazing, and and the things that seem to be coming together here is pretty impressive. And so suddenly he rose to 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 the top. Um, Gus then came in, and offered me a full ride to Michigan, which was really hard to turn down. <laughs> Plus, it's Michigan, right? And and growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan is, you know, pretty pretty amazing. Uh, so I I made that decision. Then unfortunately, Gus didn't tell me that he was thinking about retiring so he retired and um the combination of of what happened after that with the with the coach and um my grades you know just led me to you know completely reevaluate things and um i think i called up eddie once and and had pretty good times and of course now i'm in a state of transition 
and and of course the Olympics is that's done. Um, and I and I said, Eddie, still interested in me? And he said, Yeah, absolutely. Come on down. I'll give you a scholarship. So I did, and I I sat out a year. But you know, I got immediately into the school that I wanted to, the business school, and um, had to back up a little bit on classes because you have to you, you have to meet the criteria of the school that you're in, which is University of Texas. But got got the got the swim for Eddie Reese, which was you know turns out to be one of one of the great things that's ever happened to me because he was an he's an amazing coach well i found a quote in 1981 where he said that you weren't bad for a yankee and that you were learning how to say y'all did you ever figure out how to say y'all <laughs> not the way he would say it not the way he thought you should say it <laughs> not without some sort of thick accent no <laughs> I love it. So you didn't you didn't just go down there and uh, swim for Texas. You swam really fast at Texas. In 1982, you were the Southwest Conference champion in 422, um, which was uh, your last year. You lost your eligibility, right, in the transfer. Right. So you were only able no, to swim. No? You don't lose. You, you get five years to swim four. Okay. To play four. Yeah, yeah. So. So are you back in 83? I didn't finish out my fourth year of eligibility. I had a, I had, what can I say? It, it you know, um, the 1984 Olympics to me were off the table because I, I just didn't see myself, you know, not train, not training and not making any money for two years to go to Los Angeles when half the world wasn't going to show up anyways. Now that, that's maybe an excuse. And Eddie's always said to me, you know, hey, when you, decide to retire, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. Um, you know, there are times I do regret it. Absolutely. But there are times when, you know, I look at my career now and I, you know, when you're a swimmer, you, you're really swimming to, to be in school and, and to educate yourself. Um, and I was always very proud of the sport because for some reason, despite having working out six or seven hours a day, including dry lands and everything else, you know, our average grade point average, you know, in Texas, I know for, for a fact was three and a half out of four. You know, nobody was even close to us in any athletic department. And all of my friends went on to become doctors, everything. And, I, and, and then I was able to, my ultimate, you know, goal at the time was to get into a graduate school, graduate business school, an MBA program. So, which I did, I, you know, I was able to come back to Michigan and get my MBA. So, you know, that, that really drove that final decision to kind of drop out. That plus the disappointment to, to lose the UCLA by four points at the Nationals. That, and, 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 and I swam poor for that, you know. You know and so that, that, that sort of sealed the, sealed, the, sealed the deal for me. Um, it sounds like the experience and the decision to go to Austin is one that you cherish and are, are really happy that you made. I doubt there are any kids who are going to watch these. It's just going to be a bunch of us old dudes and their and their significant others, you know, watching these videos. But if any young person watches it, I'm here to tell you that the the the, the culture, the camaraderie, the the friendships you make, just they're just unequal to anything else and you know I've, i i i just would never trade the hard work the disappointing experiences the great joy you get from winning for anything i i, I really wouldn't and despite sounding like eh, maybe he you know maybe he could have been a lot better but he didn't quite give it all up you know at some point you got you move on with your life and and that's okay you know and you just got to always be, you know, working towards something better somewhere, you know. And that, that was that was the stage of my life where I decided education, school, good grades. I graduated with honors from Texas, which I was very proud of. That just became much more important than anything else. Quickly, before we kind of summarize with you here, Eddie you know, went on to amazing things. He got to Texas, I believe, in 78. And so you got there, I think, three years after he had been there. And so he was really just establishing the, what would He just won his first NCAs. Yeah, the 1981 NCAs. He, he yeah, 
he's really yeah. just establishing what will become a dynasty. And like you said, at the point yep. that you committed to him, you said, I don't really know much about this guy. Now every kid, you know, knows everything about Eddie. Yeah. 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 Do you have a sense, yeah. you know, in those two years that you got to spend with him in 81 and 82, what, what could happen or just how special he was? So he was special in all kinds of different ways. Uh, you know, first of all, the way he treated the swimmers, the way he communicated to the swimmers was just amazing. You know, he, he would talk about, you know, you know, how to be a great human being constantly. He would, he would, and he would, he, he would, you know, by example, be that person, be that human being. Um, and, uh, he, his, his personality was, his personality was just infection and, and it somehow just brought out the best in, in everyone. And he, um, he was always ahead of his time in terms of his training. Um, you know, we, we did isometrics before, I think isometrics now, which is just, you know, absolutely critical to, to swimming. Uh, we would, we would go do things in the uh, football stadium where we would tape up our hands. We'd have these two by four blocks with, uh, lawnmower wheels on either end, you know, so they could roll. And, and you remember ramps would go up and up and up, uh, uh football stadium. We would basically, after taping up our hands, just do, you know, these flies on these, with the blocks under our legs and, and, you know, the freestyle all the way up and all the way down. And, and, you know, which forced us to plank, which forced us to do all these things that, you know, at the time, you know, swimming wasn't really thinking about isometrics um, like they do now. But, uh, you know, we were doing them. You know, we were climbing ropes. We were doing all these things other than just lifting weights or, or doing the pulleys. You know, we had those pulley machines. Um, and so he was way ahead of his time up in that respect. When I was at Mission, you know, Mission Viejo, they, they had their sort of weight systems. They had their pulley systems. It was pretty much the standard sort of dry land um, uh, that you found at that time everywhere else. Uh, and so, so they hadn't really yet caught on to that, you know, get the entire body involved, you know, make, make every muscle involved in whatever you do, you know. And, but Eddie had kind of figured that out. Uh, which was, um, you know, extremely beneficial if you're, you know, a sprinter and, 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 uh, you know, because sprinters are involving every single muscle at every single moment, you know, in, in their bodies when they're swimming. And, uh, uh, so now it's just, you know, that's just, that's a big, big, big piece of, you know, swimming now. Um, yeah. it, it isn't the 21,000, 23,000 yards or meters a day as much have we talked about the most important influences in your swimming career already is there anyone that we've left out whether it be family members teammates coaches that may have come up at any of your stops that were instrumental in your success yeah well you know probably top of the list is john feeney who was my coach throughout high school and um really a guy you know who i still talk to to this day and he and his wife Karen um and put him at the top of the list and then um you know Gus was inspirational in very different ways Eddie Reese clearly you know in many different ways um just you know just the way he would instruct you on how to be a great human being uh and uh, uh you know I mentioned Al Rose you know uh, he he was uh, he was uh, the guy who made my stroke it what it is what it was <laughs> not what it is what it was and uh, uh, you know just the community I mean it was just it was a, really a, a a great spot uh, to be as a as a person growing up because uh, you know you, you created such lifelong friends everywhere. So you, you, you pulled inspiration from everybody all throughout, you know, it came from all different directions. For a guy that experienced winning state championships, state records, Southwest Conference championships, 
junior national championships in both short course and long course. A lot of really cool accomplishments. When you look back, I get a lot of answers to this question that they're most proud of of the friendships. I'd ask you to, to look at your, maybe the accomplishments, the trophies, the medals, the ribbons. What of your accomplishments are you most proud of? You know, I was, I was very proud of myself uh, from, for making the decisions I needed to make to, um, you know, adjust from Michigan to Texas, you know, so that I could do what I wanted to do in education, that I needed to do in education. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, you know, you know, turning that into a different set of, of successes. Uh, you know, um, I was very proud of that. I was uh, uh, really enjoyed Texas and Austin. And I lived there for 10 years uh, after, gra you know, from graduate, from, from the point in time I ended up there to, to after I graduated, before I went back to graduate school. And then uh, uh, I would say that was it, you know. You being one of the top two distance freestylers in those two events, and you're here, right? you are you're definitely going to be part of my old final project. So, thank you so much, John. You gave you're me welcome, so much Mark. time, so much perspective. Uh, the stuff on 78, I really appreciate you. That's not it. always the fun stuff to talk about the losses. So hopefully, we talked about enough wins that it was still fun for you. But I really appreciate your time. You're welcome very much. You're, you're very welcome, Mark.